Yes, Shalom, Amaru Khans. Hope everyone is doing well. Much love and respect to the real ones out there, the Amaru Khans. Yes, that's what we're going to be discussing uh, in this video, the name America. Right? And we're going to go into the true origin of this name. And I'm going to show you this is an indigenous name to Amaraka. Yes, Amaraka or Americ America. And this is not named after Vespucci, all right? This continent, this land is not named after Vespucci, all right? So enough with the lies, all right? So let's begin right away. Hawa. All right, so before we begin the video and the topic, right? Just wanna, uh, you know, rem remind everybody who we talking about when they're talking about this is an indigenous word. This is from indigenous people from this indigenous land here in Amaraka, Amaruka, America. All right, so these are the people that we're talking about. We're talking about the aboriginals, right? The uh, copper color races of America, right? So, you know, just to have a reference, all right? You know, Seminoles, as you can see. All right, West Indians, all right? Look at this, a Wamp uh, Chippaquiddick band of the Wampanoag. Look at that, Seminole women. All right, Wampanoag. This is Fred Thomas and his wife, Cora Thomas. All right, you can see how they depict America always. So-called Negro, right? So it's not just Africa, right? Nas Perth near Meepu, Pelton, Oregon. All right, we got American Indian and a white man. Look at the difference, all right? And we have a Ute man, which Ha Casa and his wife Apatwema, 1899. All right, remember who they showing in these tobacco ads, and then who they showing in these slave ads? It's the same people. It's American Indians, right? And we see the last so-called uh, Wampanoag. They say is the last one that was alive. This is a picture of her. All right. This is a Benaki Indian, an Abenaki Indian, a basket maker. This person has been identified as Caroline Tahamont Masta, all right? And, you know, we already know what Walter Plecker did, right? How he switched native people to color, to Negro, and to white, you know, black, all right? How they reclassified your ancestors, and now they call you Negro, colored, African-American. All right, but remember, this is the main uh, thing we're going to be talking about in this video. All right, because the Americans or the Amarucans, they're not African. As you can see in this map called Atlas Novus Sive Tabule Geograficae, very famous uh, depiction uh, of the so called uh, regions and races of the earth. All right, and uh, you see on this right side how it has the four different uh, corners, right? And you will see America right here, the top right, top bo uh, bottom right is Africa, and then you will see like Asia on this side, and the bottom left, and then Europe. All right, so this is a close up of America. You see him pointing at America. You see, these are the Aboriginal people from this. This is how they depicted you in all the ancient old maps and all depictions, most of them before the 1800s, all right, because that was the truth. You are the Aboriginal, so-called African-American. You are the indigenous person. You are the Amaru Khans. So that's why I want to show you about the word America. This is your land. This is your Amaru, your beloved land, Tamari, right? The land of the plum serpent, right? It's a cult, Amaru, the snake dynasty, the Khans, the Khan, the Nagas. You are the Nagas, all right? You are the copper color races of America, the Aboriginals, all right? Big shout out, much love to Ab the Legend. Been teaching everyone for years, all right? Respect. Long before Europeans began making maps of the New World, the Native Americans called their land Amaracapana, or Amaraca for short. Whereas the controversies concerning the discovery of America are well known, what is not well known is the controversy concerning the naming of America. In public school, 
We are erroneously taught that the Americas were named after Italian explorer and cartographer Amerigo Vespucci. The term America, we are told, is derived from the Latin version of Vespucci's first name, Americas. This fallacy was bolstered by one primary source, Walt Seymour's 1507 world map, entitled Universalis Cosmographia, drafted by German cartographers Martin Waltzi Muller and Matthias Ringman. The map was the first to assign a name to the New World, America, which historians have proffered as proof that the continent was christened after Vespucci, since he held more firmly to the growing consensus that this was indeed a New World. All right, so we begin with the book, uh, which is called Spanish and Portuguese South America during the colonial period by Robert Grant Watson as editor of Maury's Handbook of Greece, 4th edition, and also uh, author of a book called The History of Persia. So he's very uh, popular in, in these, with these historical books, right? Uh, a scholarly source. All right, so we're going to read uh, what he has to say about our topic today. All right. So we're going to begin. Uh, they start talking about Amerigo Vespucci, right? The name of America and all that. And it's very interesting because we're going to address this in this video. All right. It says Appendix 1. It says, It would naturally be expected that in a work of this kind, there should be some reference made to the long pending discussion respecting the letter addressed by Amerigo Vespucci to Lorenzo de Meldici. All right. So we're going to dodge the hijack with this whole Amerigo. We're going to see why. All right. Why I'm saying that. By which it would appear that Vespucci had visited the coast of Paria in the year 1497. That is to say, in the year previous to that of the first visit of Columbus to the South American continent. All right. So a year before Columbus reached South America. And that therefore, supposing this visit to be established, Marco Vespucci and not Columbus was the first European discoverer of the South American continent. So they're saying he discovered South America, even though Columbus got there uh, to the Caribbean before him. All right, so either way, none of them discovered anything, right? This question is one of the very first importance as regards history or geography, since on its solution depends not only the question after whom the great South American continent should be called, all right, but likewise the fair fame of Vespucci's name. All right, says so here Appendix 2. The Italian traveler Benzoni, who had been referred to in the preceding pages, has been quoted by Robertson Irvin and helps, but considering the unique position which he holds as being the first foreign critic of the proceedings of the Spaniards in South America, I scarcely think that his volume has received the full attention which it deserves at the hands of modern writers on Spanish South America. I would therefore draw attention to some extracts from his work begging the reader to bear in mind that they proceed by no means from a man of the mold of Las Casas, but from one who, by his own confession, took part in a slave hunting expedition. All right, so they're saying, all right, we're going to read this account from this person. He ain't no angel like Las Casas. That's what they're saying. He actually was a slaver. All right, it says the author in question was nevertheless, as he states, a devout Christian. So even though he was enslaving, American Indians, because that's what we're talking about here, not Africans. The author in question, it says, was nevertheless a devout Christian. And he dedicates his history of the New World to Pope Pius IV. All right, so it says, Bensoni, all right, remember the, the slaver, started for America in the year 1541, and there spent 14 years of toil and travel, landing at the Gulf of Paria. All right, this is in a South America, I believe, close to Venezuela or in Venezuela today. He proceeded to Cuba and other islands, returning thence to Acla. When he crossed to Panama, from which place he visited the kingdom of Peru, the kingdom of Peru. In this wandering course, he passed 14 years. Benzoni is the author who is originally responsible for the well-known story of Columbus and the egg. He states that while whilst at Amaracapana, all right, let me take that off so you can see that, Amaracapana, all right, so let's zoom in a little bit, it's a little better, right, I want you guys to see this, so Amaracapana, so while he was at Amaracapana, 
This is in South America. They're talking about Columbus. All right. It says, he states that whilst at Amaracapana, Amaracapana, Captain Callis arrived with upwards of 4,000 slaves, 4,000 slaves, and had captured many more. When some of them could not walk, the Spaniards, to prevent their remaining behind to make war, killed them by burying their swords in their sides of their breast. So when they couldn't uh, survive these uh, slaves they had, they would just kill them so they wouldn't, you know, make, make delays or, or stay behind or anything like that, all right? It was really a most distressing thing to see the way in which these wretched creatures, naked, tired, and lame, were treated, exhausted with hunger, sick and despairing. The unfortunate mothers with two and three children on their shoulders or clinging around their necks, overwhelmed with tears and grief, all tied with cords or with iron chains around their necks or their arms or their hands. Nor was there a girl but had been violated by the depredators. Oh man, they were even violating the girls. At page 159, Bensoni observes that Spaniards have eulogized themselves too much when they tell us that they are worthy of great praise for having converted to Christianity the tribes and nations that they subjugated. All right, so we're talking about these tribes and nations, all right? For there is great difference between the name and the being one in reality. All right, so even though they were bolstering themselves, talking about we were evangelizing them and making them civilized and Christian, all right, they were covering that, you know, the cruelties, atrocities that they were committing. All right, with that, it says the slaves, all right, this is quotes, somebody saying this, all right, it says the slaves are all marked in the face and on the arms by a hot iron with the mark of C. Then the governors and captains do as they like with them. Some are given to the soldiers so that the Spaniards afterwards sell them or gamble them away amongst each other. When ships arrive from Spain, they barter these Indians for wine. Who? Who? The Indians. All right. So let's go back. Let's go back. All right. I want you to understand what's going on here. All right. It says that Benzoni, right? Remember? He arrived at where? At Amaracapana. There was already a place called Amaracapana in South America. All right? He arrived with what? With 4,000 slaves, it says, right? Now we go back. Who were these slaves? These were Indians, right? So when ships would arrive there, what they would do from Spain? They would barter these Indians for wine, flour, biscuit, and other requisite things. And even when some of the Indian women are pregnant by the same Spaniards, they sell them without any conscience. Then the merchants carry them elsewhere. They carry them elsewhere. They take them to the other side, reverse, and sell them again, and sell them again. Others are sent to the island of Hispaniola. All right, so once they leave their mainland, their indigenous land, and they travel to these other places, right? These servants and slaves that they capture, these indigenous people, they put in captivity, prisoners of war. They would call them Negroes from there. You understand? Filing with them, filling with them some large vessels built like caravels. All right? Filling the vessels, right? Filling with what? With Indians, not Africans, Indians. And supplying what? Hispaniola. Because why? They had already um, decimated most of the population of Hispaniola through the same kind of slavery, sending them elsewhere. Uh, with their diseases, a lot of suicides, a lot of cruelties was going on, so the population would decrease fast. It would, they were, you know, I mean, we're not saying you went extinct, of course not, but they had to replenish the slave population, all right, and they did it with the other indigenous people, all right, so it says they carried them under the deck, and being nearly all people captured inland, they suffered severely the sea horrors. And not being allowed to move out of those sinks, what with their sickness and their other ones, they have to stand in the field like animals. And the sea often being calm, water and other provisions fail them, so that the poor wretches, oppressed by the heat, the stench, the thirst, and the crowding, miserably expire there below. All right, we're talking about American Indians that are experiencing this cruelty. All right, we're talking about Deuteronomy 28. And, you know, this is untold. Uh, truth of ancient America, 
all right we're in part five and you know but you see how this correlates for what we've learning in the other series right who was getting enslaved by the spanish the indians right it's another account right here letting you know straight up look what they went through in these ships all right now all that country around the gulf of paria and other places are no longer inhabited by spaniards finally out of the two million of original inhabitants of hispaniola through the number of suicides and other deaths occasioned by the oppressive labor and cruelties imposed by the spaniards there are not a hundred and fifty now to be found and this has been their way of making christians out of them what befell these poor islanders has happened also to all the other others around cuba jamaica puerto rico and other places and although an almost infinite number of the inhabitants of the mainland have been brought to these islands as slaves they have nearly all since died and it says the initial letter of the emperor charles the fifth all right so who was saying this who was describing this charles the fifth and what were they putting on their in their uh face and in their arms with a hard iron a mark of c for charles the fifth c for charles the fifth all right charles the fifth do you understand what he looked like he was another brother a cup of color so-called negro this is just another more on more war all right In short, there seems to be very little room to doubt that the world has been misled through the complimentary notice of the Florentine bishop who claimed the New World was named after Vespucci. What many American historians fail to mention or realize is that Native Americans have always had their own name for the New World. Historian Alec Locker elucidates, Children in America are taught that America came from Amerigo Vespucci the Florentine Mariner. Actually, the best evidence dating back to the earliest Spanish documents following Christopher Columbus shows that part of South America, from Venezuela to Peru, was called Amaraca by the Indians of that region. At least that is what the Spaniards understood. Various spellings of Amaraca occur in Spanish documents, beginning with the visit to that land by Alonso de Ojeda, with whom Vespucci sailed in 1499. All right, so we're in the book right now called Personal Narrative of Travels to the Equinoctial, Equinoctial Regions of America, all right? During the years 1799 and 1804, it says by Alexander von Humboldt and Aimee von Plant, all right? If you don't know, well, if you have been following me, you know who Alexander von Humboldt is, a very renowned primary source, a very uh, uh, basically uh, admired uh, so-called scholar right from those times right there that you see those years and uh, he was actually invited to many historical societies. All right, we're on page 176 of this book and it says here, um, Humboldt says, it is distressing to think that even at this day there exists European colonists in the West Indies, in the West Indies, who mark their slaves with a hot iron to know them again if they escape all right weren't we just reading about this all right charles the fifth marking his slaves with the heart the indians right the indians with a hot iron so who are we talking about still here in the 1700s all right this is the treatment bestowed on those who save other men the labor of sowing tilling and reaping all right so let's see this little cross here let's go to that little footnote in the bottom real quick all right, it says, see the little cross? All right, it says, La Brugere Caracteris. All right, chapters uh, 11, eight something, I guess this is from a book, page 300. It says, I will here cite a passage strongly characteristic of Le Brugere's benevolent feeling for his fellow creatures. It says, so he's quoting this guy, La Brugere, from 1765. It says, we find under the torrid zone certain wild animals, male and female, scattered through the country black livid and all over scorched by the sun bent to the earth which they dig and turn up with invisible perseverance 
they have something like an articulate utterance. And when they stand up on their feet, they exhibit a human face. And in fact, these creatures are men. All right, so you hear what this racist uh, French, I guess he's French, dude, is, 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 is how he's describing the indigenous aboriginals of South America, of West Indies. Remember, he's telling, he's talking about how they mark, um, you know, put hot irons on these people. And he's explaining why, because, uh, and he's showing you why this dude is a racist. He doesn't care. He sees them like animals. He's giving you an example of what he said. And I hope you um, saw what he said about how they look. All right. He said they're what? Black, livid, and all over scorched by the sun. He's talking about American Indians, so called Negro, right? We're not talking about Africans in anywhere here. All right. So let's go back up real quick. All right. And continue where we were. Now it says, in 1800, the number of slaves did not exceed 6,000 in the two provinces of Cumana and Barcelona. We're talking about Indians. When at the same period, the whole population was estimated at 110,000 inhabitants. The trade in African slaves, which the laws of the Spanish have never favored, is almost as nothing. All right, listen to this. As nothing on these coasts where the trade in American slaves was carried on in the 16th century with desolating activity, all right? Let me put that in a different words. He's telling you the trade in African slaves, right? Which the laws of the Spaniards have never favored. They didn't really care to or, or really like to go graft uh, Africans, really. It doesn't compare, it says. It's almost as nothing as what happened on these coasts on, there's nothing on these coasts where the trade in American slaves, we are talking about indigenous people, was carried on in the 16th century. What? 1500s. Way before the so-called slave trade. Right? Which desolating activity, with desolating activity. Continue says, Makarapan, anciently called Amaracapana. What? Makarapan which was anciently called Amaracapana. It wasn't named by the Europeans or Spaniards. All right, this place, which we know as Mara Macarapan, was anciently called Amaraca, Amaraca, Amaracan, Amaraca, America, Amaracapana. You understand? Amaracapana. Again, Macarapan, anciently called Amaracapana. Cumana, Araya, and particularly New Cadiz. All right, so Macarapan, which was also known as Amaracapana or Cumana. If you see all these in the maps, Araya, these are the same place. All right, or New Cadiz. So it's built on the inlet of Cubagua. Might then be considered as commercial establishments for facilitating the slave trade. What slave trade? The Indian slave trade. Girolamo Benzoni of Milan, who at the age of 22 visited Terra Firme, or South America, right, took part in some expeditions in 1542 to the coast of Bordones, Cariaco, and Paraya to carry off the unfortunate natives, all right, natives. All right, so now we're uh, coming into this book, uh, presented, it says here, uh, to the University of Toronto Library, all right, by the Ontario Legislative Library. And the book is called Discovery of the Origin of the Name of America by Thomas de St. Briss. Entered according to the Act of Congress in the year of 1888 by Thomas St. Briss in the office of the Librarian of Congress at Washington. Right of translation reserved. All right. And we're in the introduction and it says, The object of this abridged popular edition is to present in a brief, clear and simple style our discovery of the origin of the name of America, which came as unexpectedly as that of Columbus, while we were collecting from the old works of the Spanish historians. So while they were doing research in the real uh, Spanish uh, records, they were able to determine what was the origin of the name of America, right? The customs and histories of the Americans called Indians, all right? We're just talking about the cover color races, Americans, Right? Remember? Couple of colored tribes of America, Aborigines, which they called Indians by mistake, in order to show their connection with Egypt. 
Whoa. So the aboriginals of America and their connection with Egypt, all right? Where's the true ancient Egypt, all right? We're going to see the real name of ancient Egypt, what that name was. Tameri, uh, Tameri, Tamer, all right? Of which a preliminary sketch was published in 1882, the connection, all right? We have attached a map to be kept in view while reading so that a perfect idea may be obtained of the places named by Columbus and of the geography of the age when America was discovered. Asia is placed in the position given to it by the first standard map of the world on which the Western Hemisphere appeared and the Atlantic coast representing the early discoveries and settlements on this continent is taken from the first atlas where the name of America is applied to its southern division to which we have added the information obtained from a local chart showing the coast of Maraca the coast of Amaraca, Amaraca, America, Amaraca, and the kingdom of Kunding, Amaraca, the kingdom of Kunding, Amaraca. You hear all this? All right. University of Toronto. All right. The coast of Amaraca. All right. It was already here, this name, Amaraca. While the cities on the Pacific coast represent the extent of the kingdom of Amaraca, America, Amaraca at the period of its conquest by Spain. Instead of referring to the numbers, numerous Spanish authors which we have consulted in order to show the importance of this empire, so they went through this research and they're not just referencing one person, they're telling you straight up right now, right? That they went through numerous Spanish authors which have consulted in order to show the importance of this empire, the kingdom of Amarca, all right? The kingdom of the Amara, Amaru, Amarakans, Amarukans, the kingdom of the Amarukans, all right? Which only bears indirectly on our subject. We have referred our readers to a most interesting work where these scattered histories may be found collected. We speak of the well-known Prescott's History of the Conquest of Peru, a great nation. We got that book too, of which our notes only give a passing outline. We use the word king in its general sense instead of the native name of Inca, which has similar meaning, referring to exclude foreign words which tend to mystify history when an idea can be conveyed in our own. The kings of Amaraca or America, the kings of Amaraca, Amaraca or America, like the kings of England, Japan, the Mikado, Turkey, the Sultan and Persia, the Shah, were the temporal and spiritual chiefs of their dominions. Nearly all the works we have examined are to be found at the Astor Library, which with a valuable number of the American Geographical Society's maps and atlases have been the principal means of throwing light on this subject of national interest. All right, you hearing this scholarly work, the getting maps from the American Geographical Society, all right, they would correlate all for what they're saying about these kings of Amaraca or America, Amaraca, where Vespucci and Columbus landed. And that's why they went back with these stories of Amaraca or the kings and kingdoms of Amaraca, Amaracans, the Amarucans. All right. All right. So the book continues saying is the following of the principal authorities which have been consulted in this work. All right, so it gives all the references they're using for this uh, article or book they wrote. It says Adam and Tudis, all right, uh, Six Languages Americanas, American Encyclopedia, all right, and so on and so on, all right. You can slow this down and, uh, you know, take a look at all the sources and verify for yourself, all right, because there's so many. I'm not going to name them all. Look at this. Garcilaso Garcila, Garcila, Garcila de la Vega, Commentaries in La Ferreira del Inca. We got that book. All right, so a lot of these books I actually already have. Herrera, I have that in Spanish. All right, Humboldt's History of the Peru. All right, we got all these. All right, so check it out. You know, look at all these sources. All right, so you want to call it pseudo. You know, you want to say this is uh, things I'm making up. All right, but, uh, you know, there's a, there's a bigger truth that you can't handle. All right, so now we're in this book. It's called Watson's Jeffersonian Magazine. All right, from 1911, it says here, look, 10 cents per copy, a dollar per year if you just want to subscribe. 
It says the only magazine that stands for original democratic principles. Hmm, really? Again, Watson's Magazine. This is volume 13, number five. All right. All right, so we're on page 406 of this uh, magazine. And it says, The Name of America by Alexander Del Mar. I right, look him up. All right, these are not just anybody writing these things. All right. So it says that the American continent derived his name from the Florentine merchant and geographer Emeregu Vespucci, and that thereby an injustice was done to Columbus is an impression which still retains a firm hold on the popular mind. Yet many proofs have been offered that before Columbus landed, listen to this. All right, many proofs exist, my people, right? That before Columbus landed, right? The name America, the name America was found scattered over the southern continent from the Caribbean Sea to the Pacific Ocean and from the Ma Maricaibo Gulf and Amaracapana Coast, Amaracapana Coast, the Amaraca, American, the Amaracapana Coast, Amaru, Amara, Amaru Coast near the Orinoco's outlet to the mountainous regions of Cax Amaraca, Cax Amaraca around Bogota or Colombia, and over the heights of the Andes as far to the south as Peru. All right, so they use that word also in Peru, right? We know that Amaru, right? Amaru. Ex President Harrison added his influence to the popular impress impression with the remark that the continent should have been named for Columbus thereby implying that it was in fact named for Vespucci. The only evidence to sustain this assumption is the letter of a Florentine bishop in which he writes rather boastfully, and well may our new world be named America, since its discovery was due to our eminent countryman Emerigo Vespucci, etc. On the other hand, the proofs that the country bore a title much nearer to America than Emerigo may be summarized in the following citations. Giro Lemo Benzoni a Milanese in his Historia de la Mondo Novo, published at Venice in 1565, says in page 7 of the translation, the governor shortly after left Cumana, right? Remember, Cumana is just another name for Amara Capana, right? With all his company and coasting westward, went to Amara Capana. He went to where? Amara Capana. This was a town of about 40 houses and 400 Spaniards resided there constantly who annually elected a captain. All right? All right, so before we proceed, I just want to go verify this, all right? So let's go to the actual book written by Girolemo Benzoni, all right? So again, it's La Historia del Mundo Novo, or The History of the New World by Girolamo Benzoni, all right? And you saw the date, 1565. All right, let's go to the page. All right, so we're in page uh, six of this book. All right, just want to show you. All right, right here. Let me just zoom in. All right, zoomed into page six. We see the word right here, Amara Capana. All right, if you know Italian, you can verify this right now. Take a screenshot, pause it. All right, let's go back. All right, so we verified the source. All right. Humboldt and his relations historiques, a narrative of personal observations chiefly in South America from 1799 to 1804. We just got that, right? We, we went to the source. That was the first book we read, volume one, page 324, that the first settlement of the Spaniards on the mainland was Amara Capana. The coast between the Capes Paria and De La Vela appear under the names of Amara Capana and Maracapana in Codacio's map, all right? And Codacio's map of Venezuela showing the voyages of Columbus and others. All right, it says Ereda in his history of the West Indies narrates the voyage of Ojeda, 1499, whom Amerigo Vespucci accompanied as a merchant and says, finally he arrived at a port where they saw a village on the shore called Maracaibo by the natives, which had 26 large houses of bell shape built on pillars or supports with swinging bridges leading from one to another. And as this looked like Venice in appearance, he gave it that name. So that's what they say to get the name Venezuela from the word Venice, which was subsequently adopted by the Republic of Venezuela. This simple sentence is conclusive proof that at the time Vespucci made his first landing in the Western continent, the port he stopped at was called Amaracaibo, Amaraca, Amaracaibo, or America Land. 
All right, Amaracaibo or America Land. It was called America Land. With this bushy land that it was named after him. It was already called that. All right. Continue and says, Sir Walter Raleigh reached the same region in 1595. We know Walter Raleigh, right? One of the famous slavers. All right. And wrote of it as the beautiful valley of Amerioca Pana. All right. So when he arrived in this region, South America, Walter Raleigh called it the beautiful valley of Amerioca. America, Amerioca Pana, America, Amerioca, Ameriaca. Sir Walter also writing in 1596 describes one of the younger brothers of Atahualpa, the Inca of Peru, whom the Spaniards under Pizarro had slain, as taken thousands of the soldiers and nobles of Peru, and with these vanquishing all that tract and valley of America situated between the rivers Orinoco and Amazon. Besides this, the name given to the whole country between the coast of Amaraca, the coast of Amaraca, which stretched from the Orinoco River to Maracaibo, so at the A, Amaracaibo Bay, and thence to the whole country between Maracaibo Bay and the Pacific was called Amarca. All right, so again, it says that the whole country which stretched from the Orinoco River to Maracaibo Bay and thence to the whole country between Maracaibo Bay and the Pacific was called Amarca. Amarca, that whole land was called Amarca. While the whole country now known as Bogota and stretching down to Peru was called Cax Amarca. Cax Amarca. All right, you hear this? Along the heights of the Andes in this region, the name again appears in the capital city, which was also called Cax Amaraca. Cax Amaraca, in one of its nearby towns called Kult Amarca, and in the three other local names strewn to the southward along the Andes of And Amarca and Catamarca. Down near the mouth of the river Cumana was Amaraca Pana, Amaraca Pana, previously mentioned while out in the Caribbean Sea off the coast of Amaraca Pana was the large island of Tamarik. Let's look, look at this word. We're going to get into this work later on. Tamarik. All right. The island of Tamara. Tamari. Tamari. Tamarik. Tamarikan. Tamari. We're going to see what Tamara was. A Spanish mode of spelling the same word. Also a name given to one of the gods or one of the names given to the great spirit of the natives. Tamara. Wow. To these citations may be added the probability that had there been any intention to name the continent after Vespucci, his surname would have been used. All right. So he's saying, if, so if they supposedly named the continent after Vespucci, they would have used his last name, which was Vespucci. So they would have called this what? Vespucci land, whatever, you know but not his first name as, as what would be the norm, right? His surname would have been used so that the result would have been something like Vespugia, Vespugia. Instead, to be very, very little room to doubt that the world has been misled through the complimentary notice of the Florentine Bishop, all right? The world has been misled. You've been misled. This is your indigenous word, all right? This is your indigenous vibration word. Amaraka, Amaru, all right, Amaru. There seems to be a law for the evolution of continental names from names of a divinity or of a small localities which throughout use by the persons first coming into contact with the continent at that point spread gradually over the whole. Thus Europa originally designated a small village in Thessaly, but as it lay to the west of the Bosphorus, and the Hellespont, it must have been spoken of by Asiatic neighbors in a manner to facilitate its more extended application. Asia indicated originally a very small part of what is now Asia Minor, but near the dividing line. Africa meant originally only that small part of the continent lying around Carthage and with which the Romans came in contact. It was much less extended than Libya. Egypt was the name by which the Greeks knew a small seaport town 
near the mouth of the Nile and bears no resemblance to the name the Black Country by which the ancient Egyptians designated their own land. All right, we're going to get into this. Trust me. We're going to get into the real ancient name of Egypt. Because right here, they just given, they just dropped some jewels on us right here, right now. All right? So this word, this Greek word for Egypt, you know, does not mean the black country or Kemet, right? Rich soil, black soil. It does not mean that. It's telling you right now. All right? It was a small port town off the Nile. So they're telling you that just like this small town that uh, the Spaniards were encountering in South America named Amaraca, the whole continent became America. Just like Europe, Europe, they told you was a small town as well, and it became the whole continent. And Asia was a small part, which became the whole continent. Just like Africa is telling you right here, all right, was only a small part of the continent lying around Carthage. All right, it wasn't the whole continent. It didn't even exist. All right, the name China spread from a pretty mountain region on the borders of India because it was there that Europeans first came and came into a, any considerable contact with the empire. And it was by European nations that the name came to be obtruded on a nation which knew itself only as the Middle Kingdom. This shows that it is by the spread of local names indigenous to a small region that large regions are named. All right, so there again, discovery of the origin of the name of America. What led to the discovery of America? And it starts talking about, uh, you know, Matteo Polo, which is, I believe, Marco Polo's dad and his story and how they went looking for the Grand Khan. And basically, they're letting you know it's kind of like he basically came over here. Marco Polo was over here. But let's get to the part where we're talking about, about the name. All right, so let's take a look at uh, this map real quick. It's very interesting. All right, so you got La Florida right here, right? Cuba, Haiti, Dominican Republic. All right, Jamaica. You got, check it out. So then you got Sipango, Chipango. All right, this is the one of the mythical Chipango that Marco Polo went to. Chipango, Cate. Look at Cate, Cate. All right, and then you got um, Amaraca. Right here, Amaraca over Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica. We got Central America right here, Yucatan, Veragua, which is uh, part of Panama and Costa Rica. And uh, then we got South America over here. Uh, look at this. And it says Amarca or Cax Amaraca. Cax Amaraca, Andamarca. Look at that. And Amaraca, Catamarca. You see this? All right, look at this map. Golden Castle Mountains. Cartagena, Santa Margarita, Tamaraqua, look at this, Tamaraqua, 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 Hawa, Tamaraqua, Caxa Maraca, and Cusco, Titicaca, look at that. All right, and uh, we're on page uh, 35 of this book. It says, The Illustrious National Sacred Name of the greater portion of the southern continent, including that part first discovered by Columbus was America, which appeared on early maps as an appropriate honor to the great navigator who had made the discovery. This was, however, only an additional acknowledgement of gratitude, which the world owed to him. They had previously made him Admiral and Viceroy of the West Indies, named the Colombian Archipelago and the Colombian Sea. He was authorized to use the royal arms of Spain on armorials granted to him, the islands first discovered being represented on it, one of which was called Montserrato, after, this, after his birthplace. On the earliest standard map showing the Western Hemisphere, the Spanish colonists adopted the native name of America again again you saw all the sources right in the beginning again the spanish colonists adopted the native name of america they were here before all these uh, italian navigators uh Vespucci especially all right they already had this name here when they arrived as soon as columbus right columbus is supposed to be the first one right as soon as columbus got here this place was already called amaraca amaraca remember 
All right, so again, the Spanish colonists adopted the native name of America to designate their first settlement on the mainland, their first settlement on the mainland of the New World. But in those days, the rules of orthography were undefined, and in addition to the numerous errors of printing, names were spelled in any way which the writer considered most appropriate. And hence, we have America, all right? So that's how they're saying it transformed to what we know now today as A-M-E-R-I-C-A, or America, America, not only written, Amaraca, all right? So depending on who's writing it, where that person, you know, his language, where he knows how to, you know, translate certain words, you know, it could be Italian, French, uh, you know, whatever, Arab, you know, whatever. But whoever is saying it has a different way of how they said it, right? So that's what they're trying to show. So again, it has um, written Amaraca, Amerioco, and Amerioca, Amerioca, America, look at that, Amerioca, Maraca, Moraca, and America. But they added the native word Pana, which Sir Walter Raleigh explains meant an equivalent of country. And in Codice's map, the name applying to the seashore is coast of Maraca Pana. All right, so Pana again at the end just meant country or land. So when they were saying Amaraca Pana, it was the land of Amaraca, the land of America, the land, the country of Amaraca. So is there a record of a Spanish settlement named Amaruca? All right, I was able to find at least one source uh, basically recording this. I'm in this book called The Geographical and Historical Dictionary of America and the West Indies containing the entire translation of the Spanish work of Colonel Don Antonio de Alcedo, all right? Volume 1, 1812, all right? We're going to go and we go to page uh, 39 of this book. And right here it says Amaruca, Amaruca, Amaru. Ka, right, the land of the plum serpent, Amaruca, a settlement of the province of Guiana and government of Cumana. So they took the indigenous name and they just settled it and just left it as it was called already. Amaruca, the land of Amaru Kapana, right? Amaruca, a settlement of the province of Guiana and government of Cumana, one of those belonging to the missions held there by the Catalanians, Capuchin fathers. It lies south of the city of Santo Tomas, all right? Amaruca was a real place, all right? A real Spanish settlement, all right? All right, we're reading from uh, this book. Uh, it's called A Collection of Voyages and Travels Consisting of Authentic Writers in Our Own Tongue, which have not before been uh, collected in English or have only been abridged in other collections, all right? And it's a long explanation here. It says, uh, compiled from the curious and valuable library of the late Earl of Oxford, all right, so quickly we're in page 752, 752 of this book, and we're just going to belly flop to this part of the book uh, real quick. It says, on the sixth day, now they're talking about the account of uh, Walter Raleigh, all right, when he got to uh, this part of the world, Venezuela, Guiana, all right, and it says, on the sixth day, they came and stayed at the port of Morequito, that was a uh, Inca chief where he was kindly entertained and informed concerning the state of those parts from Topi Owari, Lord of Aromaya. Look at the word Aromaya. Maya, where the Y or I is Maya. And and un uncle to the aforesaid Morequito. All right. The information he received from him was that all the regions thereabout, even to Emeria, look at this, Emeria, Samaria, Emeria, Ameria, Ameria, Emeria. Come on, look at how close that is. Samaria were called Guiana. Though yet the inhabitants were called Oronoki Pony. Whoa, Pony? It's a pony? Oronoki Pony. As far as the mountains of Wakarima, which they might from thence behold afar off in the continent, beyond which he told them the large valley of Amario Capana. Amario, Amarica, Amarioca, Amarioca, Amario Capana did lie. The large valley of Mario Capana. All right, so this is what he was saying about Walter Raleigh calling the valley, the beautiful valley of, of Amario Capana, whose inhabitants were called the Guianians, and that into the provinces which lie beyond these more to the south, there came some years since multitudes of people called Oriones 
and Epudemei, who possessed themselves thereof, having driven the natives out of their ancient inheritances. The Baron de Humboldt spent several years in this part of America, 1799 to 1804. We got that right already. Humboldt, Alexander de Humboldt, and wrote three volumes containing nearly 7,000 pages of modern size. The object of his visit was to study the nation, and we need hardly refer to his rare erudition to be found in this beautiful work, which treats of nearly every subject. From him we learned that the first settlement of the Spaniards on the mainland was Amaraca, Pana. Again, Humboldt, they're reminding us what Humboldt, a very renowned primary source, a scholar, invited to all the historical societies in a lot of countries in Europe and America, right? He's telling us that the first settlement of the Spaniards on the mainland was Amaraca Pana, or the country of Amaraca, the land of America, Amaraca, which with Cumana and Cubagua, both adjoining it, were the chief places of the African slave trade, so frightfully active there in the 16th century until stopped by the Euro Emperor Charles V. All right, so touch the hijack with the African slave trade. All right, the immense quantity of pearls first attracted the attention of Columbus and the Spanish pioneers who followed him, all of whom spoke of it as the Pearl Coast. I remember that the su supposed first slaves that were or Africans that were taken or a so-called Negro that was put into slavery in an American colony in uh, I believe Bermuda or Barbados um, was uh, pearl divers right they went to get from this region of Amaraca right this is the Pearl Coast remember these were Indians all right which was the all which was on the low shore between the Capes Paria and the La Vela appearing under the names of coast of Maracapana or properly Amaraca Pana Amaraca Amaraca Pana America the land Pana Panama the land of Amaraca and Pearl Coast and the Pearl Coast both covering equally the entire shore in Codasi's map of Venezuela showing the voyages of the Admiral and others the name Maracapan was written on the early Spanish maps in red, which indicated the places first discovered by Columbus. All right, this is where Columbus landed in America, the land of America, America. All right, all right, now we're in this book, it's called Ancient Explorers of America from the Ice Age to Columbus. All right, this is the cover of the book and it's written by Alec Locker. All right, and it says here, another possible origin of the name America. Children in America are taught that America came from Amerigo Vespucci, the Florentine mariner. Actually, the best evidence dating back to the earliest Spanish documents following Christopher Columbus shows that part of South America, from Venezuela to Peru, all right, from Venezuela to Peru, was called Amaraca. All right, that region already was called Amaraca. This was an indigenous word, right? America. Amaraca, America, Amaraca, Amaraca, by the Indians of the region. Again, it was called Amaraca by the Indians of that region. All right, Guiana, all right, we know who was there originally, indigenously. At least that's what the Spaniards understood. Various spellings of Amaraca occur in Spanish documents beginning with the visit to that land by Alonso de Ojeda. All right, we got accounts of him with whom Vespucci sailed in 1499. Ojeda reported that he received friendly treatment at the hands of the Indians of Maracapana. Maracapana was also written as Amaracapana. All right, so whenever you see Maracapana, all right, like in this map right here, you'll see it right here, Maracapana. It was also written as Amaraca, Amaraca, America. America Pana. So Vespucci, Columbus, all these people landed in this region called America. And they had so much gold and pearls and everything that were coming out of there. They were going back to Spain with all these uh, stories and all this, you know, how there's so many fruits, gold everywhere, there's pearls. All right. 
uh, El Dorado, you know, the, 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 the legendary city of El Dorado. There was legends around there. They found an Inca emperor, a brother of Atahualpa. I had fled there with other soldiers and was living there in Manoa. All right, in this region called America, 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 Pana, the place where Columbus landed, all right, during his voyage past Trinidad and the Orinoco River, all right, when Columbus got to the Orinoco, you know, he was like, oh, this is the Gishon, this is coming from the earthly paradise, he thought that he was at the Gishon, one of the four rivers of Eden, all right, we already got that in past videos, right, apparently the Indians called the general area America, and Pana meant country, all right, or region. So the region of America, that's what they were calling it, Pana, Panama, Panama. Panama is close by, very close by to Colombia and Venezuela, Panama. America, the region called America. So they landed in America. You understand? They landed in America. Later visitors to the western regions of South America found that the Incas called their region Amaru, Ka, Amaru. Ka, and various subdivisions of Amaruka or Amarukan, Amarukan priest king were identified by prefix fixes such as Kunding Amaraka, Kunding Amaraka, or and Amaraka. You're gonna see that a lot. This Kunding Amaraka with the Incas. Subsequent spellings included the variant America. It seems plausible that while this Samuler labeled that area of the New World America, not in honor of Amerigo Vespucci. And so they're talking about this famous map in 1507 that has the word America right on South America. It's a little piece of South America too. They don't even know what it, well, according to that map, they didn't know what it looked like the whole of South America, all right? But they have the word America in it and it says that you know, they're saying right here, because we know that this region was called America, the region of America, all right? It seems plausible that Walden Simuler labeled that area of the New World America, not in honor of Amerigo Vespucci, but following the Spanish name derived from what the Indians called that part of the world, America, America. Thus, like so many place names in America, the continental name also derives from an Indian word, all right? So like so many places in America, the continent, the name the continent was given derived from this word, America, an Indian word, an Indian word, not the name of Vespucci. All right. All right. So we continue in the book, Discovery of the Origin of the Name of America by Thomas de St. Breeze. We're in page 43 and it says there was an abundance of fruit, flowers and beautiful birds in this charming place all right so remember where they're landing right they're landing in uh, the land of Amaraca the land or Amaraca or Amaraca Pana right and this is the journey that Ojeda the Spaniard took with uh, his Italian merchant which was Vespucci Alberigo Vespucci not Almerigo we're gonna see that all right so this is uh, basically the route that uh, Columbus took as well. This is a part that uh, Columbus landed into. He landed in America, the land of America, right? This is in South America. And you can see this is paradise, remember? Uh, Columbus said that uh, when he reached the Orinoco, he, he said it had to have been coming from the earthly paradise, one of the four rivers, all right? Now it says again, there was an abundance of fruit, flowers, and beautiful birds in this charming place. But they were determined to find some gulf where fresh water was to be had and left Paraya for the isle of Margarita, where Ojeda landed and coasted from place to place. This shore had already been discovered by the admiral, all right, that's Columbus, who knew the ground and mountain ridges well. In fact, all of this discovery was due to him, as it was from the beginning declared to the king, and yet Ojeda went all along this coast, trading for gold and pearls gold and pearls, the gold coast, pearl coast. From Margarita, he went to Cumana. Remember that um, in Maracapana, these two names, the ancient name of these two places was Amaraca, Amaraca, which is 270 miles from the island, with towns all along the sea coast. After leaving Cumana, they entered a large gulf, which was surrounded by a thickly populated country. But a river flowed into it, bringing an infinite number of what the Spaniards call lizards and the Indians caimanes, but which are really the crocodiles of the Nile. 
This is a really the crocodiles of the real Nile, according to the most reliable information. And this being unfavorable for the ships, they anchored in Maraca, Pana, or Amaraca, Amaraca, and were well received and served as if they were angels. By the great number of people of this district, we discharged the ship's cargoes and repaired them. Aided by the inhabitants, we remained here 36 days. And all this time, the Indians treated us to their bread, venison, fish, and the food was so good. The food was so good that these Indians had that ever after when we could not get it, we wished to return home. Wow. All right. So always, you know, the ancestors were helping these Europeans. You know, we were being humble. We were being kind, showing them love. And you know what they did, all right? Continues a little bit ahead. It says, we find from the foregoing history that after searching the entire coast, we're talking about the coast of South America, the only place where they found a safe harbor, fresh water, good food, and hospitality was Amaraca. So the land of Amaraca. You understand what's going on, right? The land, this beautiful land of Amaraca. Amaraca, right? Where there was gold, pearls, uh, hospitable uh, natives indigenous people that were treating them kindly there was uh fresh water great food good tasting food great food all right this is paradise amarica amarica america amarica which probably accounts for its having been the first settlement on the mainland according to baron de humboldt the excitement continued unabated in spain where several expeditions were spoken of the gold and pearls sent by columbus which we he had collected on the coast of Amaracapana. All right, so Columbus brought back some gold and pearls. He was showing it off over there in Europe and Spain. They were like, wow, where'd you get that? He was like, I got that in America. What do you mean, America? He, yeah, yeah, I got that in America. America, America. You understand this name was already here. A land he landed in Columbus. You know, this was a, a native word. All right, the people already were calling this America, all right? had caused the greatest curiosity and John Rodriguez de Fonseca, who had been appointed by the crown receiver of applications for passports and given the map of the coast, which was sent by the admiral to the government, was besieged by navigators who wished to see the chart of the country where these treasures had been collected. All right, so it became a legend, this land of America, America. All right, continuing says Nina and Guerrera, Oguera sailed for America a month after Ojeda, navigating as he did with a copy of the Admiral's map, and arrived on the coast of Amaraca, Pana, or the country or the land of Amaraca, a few days after he had sailed. On Ojeda's return to Spain, he reported the arrival of English vessels and got permission, 1501, to colonize and govern at his own expense the island of Coquipacoa. The place, however, as shown on our map, was a small isthmus and not an isle. He induced Juan de Vergara and Garcia de Ocampo to join him and provide the money. They sailed in 1502 and reaching the Gulf of Paria, traded along the coast of Amaraca, Pana, all right, until coming to some cultivated land in a beautiful valley, a beautiful valley, which was so named by Ojeda and also spoken of as famed by Columbus, all right? These people were just falling in love with this place. It became a legend, it became a paradise to them, El Dorado, all right? It is today in the province of Barcelona, formerly the port of Amaracapana, all right? So it's not in Spain, they're talking about, talking about there's a port today called Barcelona, I guess in this region or in Venezuela or wherever they are right here in Guiana, all right? But it was Amaracapana, the port of Amaracapana, the land of America for which the pioneers sailed, and is no doubt the place referred to by Sir Walter Raleigh as the beautiful valley of Amerioca, Pana, Amerio, America. Remove the O, what you get? America, America, the beautiful valley of America, seizing whatever they wanted here, while Vergara sailed to Jamaica for provisions. Continuing in the book, Discovery of the Origin of the Name of America. All right, so this part of the book is talking about who they met and encountered, Ojeda and these, uh, Vespucci uh, and Walter Raleigh. And they encountered uh, an emperor, they call him, or a chief, right, a cacique. And this is what they say about him. It says, but because there arise many doubts in how this empire has become so populous 
and adorned with so many great cities, towns, temples, and treasures, I thought good to make it known that the emperor now reigning is descended from these magnificent princes of Peru, all right, He's talking about he's an Inca, of whose large territories, of whose policies, conquests, edifices, and riches, ma many have written large discourses. For when the Spaniards conquered the said empire of Peru and had put to death Atabalipa, Atahualpa, I believe the same, which had formerly caused his elder brother, Guascar, to be slain. One of his younger brothers fled out of Peru. So they're saying that um, this emperor that was here in Venezuela riding a maraca with all this greatness and treasures and, 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 and uh, great cities, all right? It was uh, an Inca emperor that had come, the brother of Atahualpa, all right? Who had fled out of Peru and took with him many thousands of those soldiers of the empire called Oreones or noblemen, Ori Orion, 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 noblemen, that's what it means, noblemen. And with these and many others which followed him, he vanquished all that track and valley of America. And it says, see the footnote three, situated between the rivers Orinoco and Amazon. All right, so over here it says number one, the footnote, and it says Atahualpa, right? You see that? Atahualpa. All right, so number three, the footnote, let me just read that real quick. It says, in Sir Robert uh, Schoenberg's map, attached to Raleigh's work, the valley of Ameriocapana, Ameriocapana, is between the rivers referred to, all right? So it's not that he said the valley of America. It wasn't spelled that way. It was spelled Ameriocapa. But the name America was given to the mainland from Amaraca, all right? You hear this? But the name America, the name America was given to the mainland from Amaraca or America, the first Spanish settlement whose people treated them as if they were angels, while others attacked them. Many authors unaware that America was the national name of the southern continent could not understand the Spanish pioneers who gave this name to several places on the coast and cartographers hotly disputed the question as to which was correct without finding that they all were. The coast which Navarrete says Columbus first visited is the Valley of America, of Raleigh. We're talking about the Amaraca, the Valley of Amaraca, all right? Purchase edition in 1614, page 836, which quotes Ladius, Stadius, and others, says that the Brazilians have a Maraca or Tamaraca, Tama, Tamaraca. You see this? Tamaraca, this is important. Tamarac, and you see in, in Nicaragua, we're going to read about the Amaric, the Amaric, Tamarica, Tamaraca, and Tamara, Tamari, Tamara. What is the name of ancient Egypt? Do you know? I'm going to show you, which is their household god. On the same page, it refers to Vespucci's voyage to Brazil. The map of 1508 places the isle of Tamaragua. Look at that. Tamara, Tamara, Gua, Hawa, Hawa, Hawa thousands of miles away from Brazil on the coast of Amaraca Pana. Continuing in the footnote, it says, in the map of St. Dai, where the proposition emanated to call America after Vespucci, an iso is placed beside Tamaragua, named Iso of Brazil. We observe on modern maps the Iso of Maraca, near the mouth of the Amazon in Brazil. This is circumstantial evidence that St. Dai people, who got their information from Vespucci, had heard of the port of Amaraca Pana, Amaraca Pana, where Ojeda was so hospitably received when Vespucci was with him, and also of the Maraca or Amaraca. Listen to this. Also the Maraca or Amaraca of Brazil, Amaraca, America, Amaraca of Brazil, and so they placed the island of Amaraca in Brazil on the coast of Amaraca Pana. And it was evidently this similarity of name with Amerigo, called Morigo by Ojeda, that led them to suppose that the name came from him. But we're going to see his real name. It's not even Amerigo. It's Alberigo. All right. We're going to see that. And that means Albert. The Ptolemy Pot map of 1524 places the supposed Isle of Brazil in the Atlantic Ocean, nearer to England than America, which 
name appears on the continent in the same latitude and longitude as Aymarca. You see that? That name, Aymarca, Amaraca, Aymarca. They had, they knew about America. Aymarca, Amaraca, Amaru. All right, we're going to see what this leads to. They're going to know. All right, it's going to lead to priest kings, the cons. All right. So, Plotomy's map has Aymarca. The same evidence occurs in Plotomy's in 1535. The name of the Brazilian god Tamaraca, Tamaraca, explains the proximity of the Isles of Brazil and Tamara, Tamaragua in the same day map of 1513. The prophets of the Brazilians were the Caribs, whose god was Hua Amaracan, Hua Amaracan, Hua Amaracan, Ahua, Hawa, Hawa, Hua, Ahua, Hawa, Amaracan. The Plotomy map of 1540 states that the new world is called Brazil and America and America and they also place it in the latitude and longitude of the native district of Ayamaraca 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 Amaraca then comes Mercator next year who places the name of America over the entire continent so eventually this name right this valley this place this region was so popular Amaraca it was being uh, told was being brought back by many explorers and, and, and Europeans and eventually became the name of the entire continent, all right? America is Amaraca, the land of Amaraca. All right, continuing in the book, Discovery of the Origin of the Name of America, all right? This very scholarly book with all the sources it has. It says the Golden Castles Mountains, the Golden Castles Mountains on the coast of Amaraca, the first Spanish settlement in the Western Hemisphere. The very first one was in Amaraca. All right. It says down here, the territory of Ojeda was to the east of the Gulf to be known as New Andalusia after a Spanish province while Nicuesa had the Western side, which for the first time appeared under the name of Golden Castles on the coast of Amaraca. All right. This is found in the Kodasi map in the Humboldt's Relations Historics in Volume 1, all right? In the fertile island of Jamaica. Again, on the coast of Amaraca or America, all right? And the fertile island of Jamaica was to be the joint granary, the fertile, very fertile island of Jamaica. It says here, Pissarro related everywhere the wonderful stories of the Golden Land. During this visit, all right, the golden land, the gold coast, Guiana, Guinea, come on. And they were repeated throughout the dominions of his sovereign. The king of Spain and emperor of Germany, one of whose friends, the great German mercantile house of Belsers, got authority during the year that Pizarro had returned to found cities and to mine in the mountains called Golden Castles. The mountains called Golden Castles on the coast of Amaraca, Amaracapana, the land, the country of Amaraca. Their people landing in the Orinaco, as Sir Walter Riley had done, settled at Amaracapana, from which place the German featherman led an expedition to Bogota in search of the, its treasures in 1534, while another marched across the Andes, commanded by Quisada from Quito on the Pacific, and a third under the Spanish governor of Popoyan, all of whom accidentally met there. But they did not find the gold, though Quisada sent expedition after expedition for years in search of it. Fetterman returned to his district of which Sir Walter Raleigh speaks, beyond us lay another town towards the south in the valley of Amerioca, Ameri, Amerioca, Pana, which bears the name of the said valley. That is the name of that valley, all right? America, Pana, whose plains stretch themselves some 60 miles in length, east and west, as far ground, as fair ground, and as beautiful fields as any man has ever seen, with diverse copses scattered here and there by the riverside and all as full of deer as any forest or park in England and every lake and river the like abundance of fish and fowl of which Ira Para Gota is Lord all right so this is a paradise this valley of Amaraca America this valley all right Pizarro arriving again crossed over to Panama and returned January 1531 to Tumbes where they remained five months before marching to Casa Amaraca. Casa Amaraca, the capital of the empire. What are they talking about, Casa? Are they talking about Cusco? Remember Cusco? 
Their empire was called also something like Cooks, Cuxca Amarca. We have here Casa Amarca, the capital of the empire. We know Pizarro was the one who invaded the Inca. On the way, they stopped at Caxas, where messengers from the king had arrived with an invitation to visit him and a present of two stone mountains in the form of forts, some woolen stuff embroidered with gold and silver, and a quantity of perfume powder used by the native nobility. All right, so uh, we know that Pizarro eventually, you know, invaded and, uh, you know, took uh, prisoners and, and murdered many Incas um, and took the whole empire and the capital of Cusco. So this is after, and it says that as the population on the Atlantic side of the Andes mountain are also Quichua, Quichua or Amaracan, Amaracan, let us now recall some of the history of the great Chipcha kingdom of Kunding Amaraca, Kunding Amaraca, the neighbors of the nation just spoken of. It says here, their, their kingdom of Kunding Amaraca and its capital of Bogota now forms part of the United States of Colombia in Central America containing 100,000 square miles of territory, which may be found in longitude 74 and latitude 4 and 6 north. The kings of Amaraca on the Pacific coast had a road, which followed the course of the Andes Mountains, connecting their city with the capital of Kunding, Amaraca. Continuing the book, it says, we have an account of it from Dr. Don Luis Fernandez Piedrajita, canon of the Metropolitan Church of Bogota, Calificador of the Holy Office of the Supreme and General Inquisition and Bishop-elect of Santa Marta. This work was dedicated in the year 1688 to His Majesty, the King of Spain. And of the Indies, the Bishop informs us that Kundin Amaraca, Kundin Amaraca, as the heathens called it, or the Indians, they called them heathens, right? Was the most important kingdom after Peru and Mexico, or apart from, you know, the Incas and, you know, the Mexica, Toltec, you know, Olmec, you know, Maya empires in Mexico. The chiefs of its population and the court of the barbarous king were at the capital, Bogota. So it seems the capital of Cundinamarca Maraca was in Bogota, right, in Colombia. To their idols of solid gold, they offered emeralds powdered with gold dust. The city had 20,000 houses in the days of its fame, and the king with his 200 wives resided in an immense palace guarded by 12 gates which were entered by solid stone staircases all right so you think it was just teepees all right immense palace all right dumb diverses right they came to take your kingdoms your dukedoms your principalities all right your palaces all right the author explains the rites and ceremonies of the muishkas under paganism and informs us that they that when they anyone died from the bite of a snake that the sign of the cross was placed on the tomb, which is the American Peruvian sign for the word Amaru. Boom. Oh. Bow right there, man. I mean this correlates so much for me. Alright. So they put the sign of the cross. Anybody who got bit by a snake? And it says that this sign Alright is the Peruvian sign for the word Amaru, you see right here, you see the cross, Amaru, Amaru, and with the addition of the word Ka, or land, represents the sacred national name, America, all right, Amaru, Ka, Amaru, Ka, the land of the cross, or who are they talking about Amaru when they're talking about Amaru? It is clear then, that America was never named after or even by any European at all but is an adaptation from the native's own term Amaraka, or alternatively Amaruka. The spelling and pronunciation of the term was simply modified for European tongues, but its meaning remains the same. The meaning of Amaruka can be deduced by examining the name of the last ruler and the bloodline of the Inca emperors, Tupac Amaru. Tupac Amaru led the final insurrection against the Spaniards in Peru from the last stronghold of the Incas in Vilcabamba, but was summarily defeated and beheaded. His name holds the key to understanding the true connotation of the word America. Steve Quayle explains, Tupac was an Incan royalty title which meant 
one who glows, or one who shines. Amaru means serpent, Quetzalcoatl. Additionally, Amaru in the Incan language also has connotations of being a serpent connected to the subterranean or underworld. All right, so real quick, we're in the website for Atlantis Rising magazine. So Atlantis Rising, I used to subscribe to this magazine way before there was internet. I used to get a lot of drop there, you know, all these historic and uh, cons uh, conspiracies and mysteries, you know, that they told us about. I was that was me. I was into all that way back. All right, so it says here, Amaruka to America, Amaruka. We just got that in the last book, right? What does it mean? The cross, right? In the 15 years that separated the discovery of the new world and the placing of the name America on the map, there were numerous ocean crossings that may have brought home the name America. All right. Numerous Spanish voyages reached the Caribbean islands in Central America. In Nicaragua, the Spanish explorers met up with a tribe called the Amerique. All right, we're going to get into that. These people told the Spanish that their land was rich in gold. A French geologist, Jules Marco, said the Spanish brought this name home. All right, so the Spanish brought this name with them from the Americas back to Europe. It wasn't Vespucci. It wasn't named after Vespucci. The mountain range in Nicaragua was land of perpetual wind and called Amerique, Ameriac, and actually recorded in the sailing logs of Columbus himself. Augustus Le, Plon Le Plongin said the word America or Amérique actually meant land of the wind in the Mayan language. Le Plégeon was a French-American photographer, archaeologist, and author who produced several books that connected the Mayans to the old world. What did I tell you? All right, this is the true old world, and the Mayans are the Nagas who went over to Indi Hindustan. The Nagas, we, this is the old world. All right, who's the Nagas, right? The serpents, all right? What are we about to get into? Check it out. A Peruvian people were called the Amaruca. All right, Amaruca. They worshiped a god named Amaru, a god. Amaru, Amaru. All right, let's go back. So remember that the cross was placed on the tomb, which is the American Peruvian sign for the word Amaru, the cross. And with the addition of the word ka or land, it represents the sacred national name America. All right, let's go back. All right, it says a god named Amaru, who was similar to the plum serpent of the Maya. Amaru was the plum serpent. It was the same. All right, and who was the plum serpent? Quetzalcoatl, right? Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl. So they're saying Amaru is Quetzalcoatl. It is the plum serpent. All right, what are we talking about here? We're just talking about snakes, right? Serpent, right? We're talking about dragons. What are we talking about? Flying a plum serpent with feathers. Discoveries continue to be made in the land of Amaruca, which contains the remarkable Machu Picchu. The last of the Inca leaders was Tupac Amaru. Tupac Amaru, who was executed by the Spanish in 1572. When the Spanish landed in Colombia, they were also told they were in the land of Amaruca. You're in the land of Amaruca. Uh, you better recognize that, they told them. You're in the land of Amaruca. Amaru, the land of Amaru. Or the plum serpent. You're in the land of the plum serpent. You understand? In the land of Quetzalcoatl. And who was Quetzalcoatl? We're going to get into that. It would not be incorrect to assume this was a wide-ranging area that held a group of related civilizations sharing certain characteristics. All right, so we're in this book. It's called The Secret Teachings of All Ages. Y'all, A lot of you probably familiar with this book have heard of it. Of course, I know a lot of you have heard of Manly P. Hall. You know who that is. Yeah, we're talking about, you know, high-degree Freemasons here. Yeah, we know. But, you know, they be dropping jewels and they, they teach themselves these things. You know, they, they keep the truth to themselves because, you know, knowledge is power, right? So they use this power against us, right? But then they add their hijack into it, right? So, but they know certain things, right, that we're learning today. They, they've known these things, all right? So let me just show you one example of what we were just talking about, all right? So, and it says here, the red children of the sun, the red, all right? Copper colored, <laughs> red, they call you the red man, right? Right, writes James Morgan Preecy. Do not worship the one God. For them, that one God is absolutely impersonal. And all of the forces emanated from that one God are personal. 
This is the exact reverse of the popular Western conception of a personal God and personal work and forces in nature. Decide for yourself which of these beliefs is the more f philosophical. These children of the sun adore the plumbed serpent. Mm, they adore the plumbed serpent, really. Who is the messenger of the sun? The messenger of the sun? He was the god Quetzalcoatl. All right, so the plumbed serpent is Quetzalcoatl, right? We just got that before. All right, the Amaru is the plumbed serpent. So the plumbed serpent is Quetzalcoatl. So we're talking about the same thing. In Mexico, uh, Gukumats and Quiche, same person. And in Peru, he was called Amaru. He was called Amaru Quetzalcoatl. From the latter name comes our word America. From the latter, from this Amaru, Amara, remember? The land of Amaraca, Amaruca is literally translated land of the plum serpent. Amaruca is the land of the plum serpent. America is the land of Amaru, the land of Quetzalcoatl, the land of plum serpent, the dragon, right? The priest of this god of peace from their chief center in the Cordilleras once ruled both Americas. The priest of this god of peace. Who are we talking about? We're talking about Prester John? We're talking about King David? We're talking about King David? Who once ruled both Americas, North and South? All right, Mexico and Peru? All the kingdoms of the Israelites? All the red men who have remained true to the ancient religion? And all you still who are called red men? Talking about the so-called Negro, right? Who have remained true to your ancient religion or your ancient law, your ancient ancient connection with your Creator, Most High, are still under their sway. One of their strong centers was in Guatemala, and of their order was the author of the book called Popol Vuh. In the Quiche tongue, Gugu Gukumats is the exact equivalent of Quetzalcoatl in the Nahuatl language, Quetzal, the bird of paradise, Coat serpent the serpent built in plumes of the paradise bird all right this is deep right here we're gonna get, get into this a little bit more all right all right so let's learn a little bit about this character amaru amaru aka Quetzalcoatl, gugu mats all right kuku khan all right so we're in this book publications of the university of pennsylvania a series in philology literature and archaeology volume 3 says a primer of mayan hieroglyphics all right by daniel g brinton and a m m d l l d s c look at he got all the letters all right professor of american archaeology and linguistics in the university of pennsylvania president of the american association for the advancement of science etc etc now right, we're going to pick up here in page 39 right about here it says in the myth he is described as clothed in a long robe now they're talking about uh itzama who is uh they're relating to Kukumats and Kukulkan, and we know that it's the same as Kitsukot. We got that uh, as well uh from the last readings that Amaru is also Kukutsmats, right? Right, in Kishe. So it's, we're talking about the same people. So it says that this person, right, this this mythical person is described as clothed in a long robe, all right? A long robe, long robe, and wearing sandals. Hmm. A long robe and wearing sandals. And what is noteworthy having a beard. What is noteworthy? What is most noteworthy? All right, because he has a long robe, sandals, and a beard. Who does that describe him, man? Who does that sound like? In the calendars of the centals, he was painted in the likeness of a man and a snake. And the masters explained this as the snake with feathers, which moves in the waters. That is, the heavenly waters, the cloud and the rains, for which recent Bishop Nunez de la Vega, to whom we owe this information, identified him with the Mexican mixed cult, the cloud serpent. Whereas Bishop Landa was in opinion that he was the Mexican Quetzalcoatl. All right. Amaru. All right. So we're talking about Quetzalcoatl. But remember why we got there, right? Because we were talking about the kings of Amaraca or Amaru, right? Amaraca, Amaru, right? On the Pacific coast had a road which followed the course of the Andes mountains connecting their city with the capital of Kundin, Amaraca. Right, remember this was in Bogota, which is modern day Colombia today, Bogota. Right, Bogota. And remember that it told us uh, down here that, that they placed a cross right on the tomb, which was the American Peruvian sign for the word Amaru, a cross, Amaru. 
All right, and with the addition of the word ka or land represents a sacred national name, America. So remember, Amaru is Quetzalcoatl. All right. So we're, di we're in this other book called Researches Concerning the Institutions and Monuments of the Ancient Inhabitants of America. Uh, this is written by Alexander D. Humboldt. Again, this is another book by Alexander D. Humboldt that we've read from it before. All right, we're going to go to page uh, 29. So we'll start out the page uh, at the bottom of page 28. It says, though no traditions point out any direct connection between the nations of North and South America, their history is not less fraught with ana analogies in the political and religious revolutions from which states the civilization of the Aztecs, the Muiscas, and the Peruvians. I right, Muiscas, we've got that in the, in the other book. Men with beards, again, men with beards and with clearer complexions than the natives of Anahuac. Cundinamarca, look at that, Cundin Anamarca, Anamarca, there you go, Anamarca. That's in Bogota, right, with the kings of Amaraca were. All right, so these uh, people with beards with clearer complexions does not mean white, that doesn't mean white and the elevated plain of Cusco make their appearance without any indication of the place of their birth and bearing the title of high priest high priest of legislators right lawgivers of the friends of peace and the arts which flourish under its auspices operated sudden change in the policy of the nations who hailed their arrival with veneration Quetzalcoatl, Boshika and Manco Capac are the sacred names of these mysterious beings all right so Quetzalcoatl who is Amaru remember Quetzalcoatl is Amaru is also Boshika from the Bogo from the people in Colombia or Bogota region same place as where Kundin Aramarca is all right and Manco Capac is an Amaru right and Inca one of the first all right it says Quetzalcoatl clothes in a black sacerdotal robe a black sacerdotal robe all right in a robe again comes from Panuco, from the shores of the Gulf of Mexico. Boshika, the Buddha of the Muishkas, the Buddha. Who's the real Buddha? We're talking about Quetzalcoatl, right? We're talking about that Buddha's first name is Guatama, right? Like Guatemala. Guatemala and his mom's name is Maya, right? Buddha's mom's name is Maya. We're talking about Quetzalcoatl, all right? Who is Boshika? Who is the Buddha of the Muishkas? Muishka, Meshak Muishka, Moshko. Mo Moshe. All right, now we're in this different book. All right, it's a little blurry. All right, but bear with me. You know, that's the way it's just, you know, it is. It was very pixelated. All right, but it's called The Myths of Mexico and Peru by Louis Spence. All right, got him from some of my Atlantis books. Very good author. Uh, quotes a lot of good sources. All right, and it says here Quetzalcoatl is Quetzalcoatl. It is highly probable that Quetzalcoatl was a deity of the pre. Nahua people of Mexico. All right, pre meaning before the Nahua, says he was regarded as the father of the Toltecs. And legend says that the seventh and youngest son of the Toltec Abraham, each Tachimosh Kuhot, hmm, gets a coat, whose name means feathered serpent or feathered staff, staff, the staff, became a relatively early period ruler of Tolan. And by his enlightened sway and his encouragement of the liberal arts did much to further the advancement of his people. Perhaps the most important of these is that which regards Quetzalcoatl as a god of the air. He is connected, say some, with the cardinal points and wears the insignia of the cross. He wears the insignia of the cross which symbolizes them. Again, we're in the book Discovery of the Origin of the Name of America, all right? We're still talking about the name of America, right? It says that they put the sign of the cross was placed on the tombs of people who got bit by snakes, which is the American Peruvian sign for the word Amaru. The cross is Amaru, is Quetzalcoatl, the cross, Amaru. And with the addition of the word Ka or land represents the sacred national name America, Amaru, Amaru, the cross. The cross. We're in the book Anacalypsis, an attempt to draw aside the veil of the static Isis or the inquiry into the origin of the languages, nations, and religions by the late Je Godfrey Higgins. All right, volume two, 1836. All right, and it says here Quetzalcoatl or Cotle is represented in the paintings of the Codex Borgianus. All right, so he's represented in the Mexican Codex. 
right? Nailed to the cross. Nailed to the cross. Some sometimes even to two thieves are the crucified with him. So it says sometimes even two thieves are crucified with him, just like the story of Jesus, right? It's a coat, all right? In volume two, plate 75, the God is crucified in the heavens in a circle of 19 figures, the number of the metonic cycle. A serpent is depriving him of the organs of generation. In the Codex Borgianus, the Mexican God is represented crucified and nailed to the cross and in another place hanging to it with a cross in his hands. And in one instance where the figure is not merely outlined, the cross is red. The clothes are colored and the face and hands quite black the face and hands quite black if this was the christianity of the german nestorius how came how came he to teach that the crucified savior was black oh why didn't he teach that the savior was so-called black or a negro right copper colored right why didn't they teach that you see what they're telling you and these codices in the uh, aztec and uh, these mexican codices right it's a cult or the person being crucified their savior right who's being crucified is black or so-called black a negro person all right the name of the god who was crucified was quetzalcoatl again quetzalcoatl all right we're back in the book mythos of mexico and peru and it, i mean there's this image here and they're talking about quetzalcoatl right all right and uh, i just want you to let me just close in i mean let me just show you this is another copy of the same book uh, you can see this image right here, which says the age gets a cold, leaves Mexico on a raft of serpents, on a raft of serpents, right? Is he flying on a dragon? What's, what's going on here? All right, so gets a cold, right? You can't see him, right? But on this version of it, which is blurry, if we zoom in, we can see him, right? Let's just zoom in to him real quick. All right, can y'all see this? Can y'all kind of make out? Look what they're showing you right here. This is gets a cold. Look at the clothing, the robe, look at the beard. You can almost see long hair. All right, this is the PDF I got of it. So you can see it a bit better. Who is that? Is this the, the Grand Khan? Is this King David? Is this Prester John? Meshi Moses Kitsakol Jehoshua Jahawashi? Who are we looking at right here? Amaru Kitsakol Amaru. This here, Ancient America Foundation. All right, says so Italy Chotlint, which is uh, an author uh, in those times, a Spaniard, um, maybe mixed with Indian Quetzalcoatl and Jesus Christ. Says here, all right. Says so in Mexico's great central mesa where Itli Chotlint lived, the name by which the fair god of ancient America was generally known was Quetzalcoatl. Quetzal was the name of the beautiful bird with the resplendent long green feathers and the dainty crest. Colt is the ancient Mexican word for serpent. Thus the name Quetzalcoatl means literally Quetzal bird, serpent. Quetzalcoatl was the name applied to the New World, God who was in the form of a man, bearded, white robed, and a great teacher of moral principles. All right. A bearded man with a, with a robe and a great teacher of moral principles, the colt or serpent was an ancient symbol of Israel's Messiah, the Anointed One. So the serpent meant the Anointed One. All right. All right. So uh, just one quick reference, one more of uh, Quetzalcoatl. We're in this book, Antiquities of Mexico, by Lord Kingsborough. I've explained this book in some of my videos before. Uh, research, you know, his nine volume collection, what it's about and everything, all these prestige libraries that are holding all these. It's a facsimiles, all right? Facsimiles of the Mexican codices, meaning exact copies, all right? They're breaking down the plates and the codices, all right? So it says here, plate two. Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl. And it has this two marks here, right? You see that? Let's go to that footnote right now. It says, the Messiah. The Messiah is shadowed in the Old Testament under many types, such as those of a lion, a lamb, a roe, the morning star, or the planet Venus, otherwise called Lucifer, the sun, light, a rock, a stone, the branch, the vine, wine, bread, water, life, the way. And he is there recognized in the triple character of a king, a priest, and a prophet. We're talking about a Khan, king priest, a prophet. It is very extraordinary that Ke Quetzalcoatl, Cotle, who the Mexicans believe equally to have been a king, 
a prophet, any pontiff, should also have been named by them Seja Cult or the Morning Star, Telaviscal Pantecutli or Light, Mesitli, Meshitli, Meshi, Messiah, Meshi. All right, so Messiah says Quetzalcoatl again is he who was born of the Virgin. He was born of a virgin. Whoa. So wait a minute. So wasn't also Jesus born of a virgin? Did you know Quetzalcoatl was born of a virgin? You see these stories, but they originate, right? All right, so we're in this uh, book. It's called A Book of the Beginnings by Gerald Massey. All right. And it says here, As Shu and Anhar in Egyptian mythology and Moses and Joshua conducted their people with the solar orb round the circle of science, overcoming the opposing powers postulated by the early men. So in the Toltec mythology, Huemak or Huematzin and Quetzalcoatl, Quetzalcoatl conducted their people through the pilgrimage and wanderings recorded in their picture writing. Huemak, like Moses, wrote the code of laws for the nation and conducted the civil government. Quetzalcoatl, in relation to Huemak, plays the part of Joshua. Again, Quetzalcoatl, in relation to Huemak, plays the part of Joshua. All right, so we weren't, we ain't talking about an allegorical New Testament Roman propaganda. Uh, Jesus, we're talking about the Torah. We're talking about foundational truth we're talking about the person who really led the israelites into jerusalem who took over after moses meshi who's called in the old testament joshua but his name is jahawashi right or jehoshua jahawashi all right when quetzalcoatl began to give the laws instead of huemak he sent a crier to the top of the mountain of outcry whose voice could be heard for 300 miles round Joshua follows Moses as the leader of Israel and instructs the people to go up against Jericho, his mountain of outcry, and assail it with a shout that ought to have been heard at an equal distance as it was loud enough to make the walls fall flat. The old red land, red land, Hue, Hue Tlapalang, was the name of the original home in the north from which the Toltecs migrated. All right, they're talking about Utah, what are you talking about? Their leader, Kitsukot, wore a long robe with crosses he wore a long robe with crosses again discovery of the origin of the name of america right it told us that when the person got bit by a snake they put the sign of the cross on their tomb which is the american peruvian sign for the word amaru the cross amaru it is amaluk cross amaru synonymous cross all right so again amaru is quetzalcoatl and quetzalcoatl all right, again, he wears a long robe mark with crosses, crosses, Amaru, cross. The sign identifies him as the one who crosses, the one who crosses. Quetzalcoatl attained the land of promise, and in his golden reign, an ear of wheat grew so large that one man could hardly carry it. Joshua led the people into the land flown with milk and honey, where a single bunch of grapes was a load for two men. All right, so we're talking about Jahawashi, Quetzalcoatl. Amaru, I know we went off the subject a little bit, but you know it has to do with you know what we're talking about, right? They just added the ka, so it's the land of Amaraka, Amaru, Ketsako, the plum serpent, the Khan, the priest kings, the land of the priest kings. You understand, Pastor John, King David. We're talking about uh, ancient uh, the, the seed. We're talking about the true Ibaria. In order to fully grasp the implications of America, land of the plumed serpent, we need to explore the oldest religion on earth and its connection to the mythology of the three greatest civilizations that once existed in the Americas, the Mayans, the Aztecs, and the Incas. All right, so we're in the book again, Discovery of the Origin of the Name of America. It says here, the Andes silver mines of Peru and Kundi Amaraca are yet the richest in existence and the finest gems of these mountains are the emeralds found in the Tunga mines near Bogota, which supply nearly the entire market of the world. All right, you see that footnote number two? So that's the American Encyclopedia. They're telling you, you know, where they get all the supply, the most of the supply in the world from over here in America, right? The land of milk and honey, the real one, right? Now it says, this is the neighborhood about which the Spaniards heard such fabulous stories of wealth that so many expeditions left in search of the golden city, El Dorado. All right, because it, it shines because of the gold, is a Dorado gold. 
Baron de Humboldt, who had spent many years in these regions, says that Luis Daza met 1535 an Indian of Kundin Amaraca at Casa Amaraca, who was sent by his sovereign to ask the assistance of King Atahualpa, and as usual praised the richness of his country to Daza. But what fixed the attention of the Spaniards was the story of a lord whose body was covered with gold dust and who lived at a lake in the middle of the mountains. A chief or a lord who was covered in gold dust. So now talk about El Dorado. So El Dorado, when you think about it, a person covered in gold dust in Spanish, you would say El Dorado. Right? So are they were they always talking about a city or a per specific person? And who are we talking about here? We talking about a priest king? Are we talking about a King David? What are we talking about here? This was probably that to the east of Iraca and Tunga, where the two spiritual and secular chiefs of the empire of Kundin Amarca lived. Its temple of the sun was not far from the north side of the lands first found by the Spaniards. The high priest powdered his face and hands with gold dust every morning which he had previously oiled the grease so as to retain it before offering sacrifice. Here the chief kingdom in the western hemisphere when Columbus landed was Amaraca or America. Again, was Amaraca, the chief kingdom. It was called Amaraca, whose Inca kings, part of the Incas, claimed descent from the Ayamara, Ayamara race, Ayamara, Amara, Ka, Ayamara, Amaru, Amara, plum serpent, snake kings of Ayamaraca, Ayamara race of the Ayamaraca, the earliest known of the existing population from whom these monarchs who resembled them got some of their arts and religious ceremonies. The natural history of Amaraca names Saint Amaraca or America, the capital, as the first city of their empire. All right, so it says, to see unabridged edition, the Spanish wrote it Guamarca, Guamarca, Gumarca, and pronounced it G, which does not exist with natives, like an H, so Huamarca, Huamarca, which gives us a Hua, or saint, a word added to their sacred names, while their history indicates that it ought to be Hua Ma Amaraca, or America, it is near the celebrated lake Amatitlan. These people were the Quichua race, and from this the Castilians called the city the Holy Cross of Quichua. The latter name only being used today, the Amaru or Holy Cross of these people. Again, the Amaru or Holy Cross, Holy Cross, Amaru Cross, Quetzalcoatl Cross of these people was conspicuous there, as in all the chief cities of America. It is the central object of adoration in the immense sacred ruins of Palenque, from which the continent was probably first called Land of the Holy Cross. Land of the Holy Cross, Amaru, Land of Amaru, Holy Cross. One author has attempted to find the etymology of Gumarca by phonetic comparison, forgetting that in pictorial literature, the meaning of a sign when lost can only be obtained by its morphological classification. The Spaniards endeavored to turn the American names into familiar sounds, as in the city of Rimac, which is today known as Lima. The kings of America claim descent from the Amara race, who are still existing and the most ancient race on the continent. All right, you're still ex you still exist and you're the most ancient race on the continent. Amaru, Khan, in the map of Peru by the Haliok Society, showing the cradle of the Incas, may be seen Ayamaraca. Ayamaraca. In this neighborhood is an American city which Ciesa de Leon says is the finest in America, with magnificent houses built of cut stone and massive fortifications. The name given it was Guamanga, but we find in Torres Dictionary that Hua Manca is more correct. When the Ayamaras moved south, they probably founded another Hua Amaraca before the Inca kings followed and took it from them. The war which broke out between Antahualpa and Huascar began by the former seizure of a rich province and his brother's kingdom, who took him prisoner, but he escaped and told his people that the sun turned him into an Amaru. The sun turned him into a plum serpent? What's he talking about? Amaru? 
which enabled him to return, and this inflamed their religious sentiment to such ex an extent that they vanquished the enemy and captured King Huascar, Ciesa de Leon, Haliuk Society, where in the book still discovery of the origin of the name of America, says the Amaracan or American National History. The celebrated Amaracans or Americans, improperly called Peruvians, had a sacred book, and it says Popol Vuh. So I thought that was the Mayas. So they're telling you that the Amaracans, who are called Peruvians today, right, improperly, because it's all the same people they're trying to let you know, all right, they also had the Popol Vuh. It says Casa Amaraca. And it says three, right? The footnote in the three, and it says the kings performed miracles, miracles here. So the kings performed miracles. Who were these Amaracan kings? Amaru, Amaru, plum serpent, gets a cold. What are we talking about? Was the royal sacred necropolis, and near it is Pult Amarca, where the sulfur springs are still called the king's baths. Ja, Jan Amaraca was their Hercules. From John, behold, the present indicative of the verb Janhal to be. Behold, America was an appropriate name for the American Hercules. There was Bin Amarca in the Gulf where Manco Capac, the prince of American legislators and first Inca king, received his divine vocation. And we got before that Manco Capac was Quetzalcoatl too and Boshica. All right, from Colombia, same people, same person. Then, then there were the cities of Ang Amarca, Chempi Amarca, Yuria Amarca, Cat Amarca, Col Amarca, and Patinamit Amarca, or America the capital. Hmm. The only one which appears in their ancient documents and sacred history as the foundation of their kingdom. All right. This is real stuff they never teach us, all right? They had this word already, all right? Splendor of the kings of America, their mountain cities, palaces, and customs. The kings or Incas, according to their own and other native history, were conquerors of nations. Already in an advanced state of civilization, they selected the very best and richest part of the continent for their strongholds and paid particular attention to its gold mines which were nearly all in the Andes, the most compact mountain system in the world running along the Pacific coast almost the entire length of South America, from Patagonia, the southern end of the Pacific Ocean, to the Caribbean Sea and the Atlantic, a distance of at least 4,500 miles. At latitude 22 south, this mountain divides into two colossal ridges, which enclose a valley 500 miles long, 3260 wide, uh, 30 1500 feet above the level of the sea and so completely walled in by high mountains that its streams which have not any outlet apparently meet in a famous lake of 4600 square miles Titicaca the largest in South America where the beautiful palaces of the vessel virgins of Amaraca Amaraca in the island of Coati have been excavated for centuries the work still going on a Spanish explorer having found gold and silver to the extent of $4,450,280 in one of them. In another island of this lake, where the first American high priest, Manco Capac, received his divine call from heaven, becoming a child of the sun, there are immense sacred ruins at Tijuanaco. A tradition is still repeated of large vaults filled with treasure beneath the great mound and of subterraneous passage leading to Cusco, one of the royal cities 400 miles away, where among the innumerable sculptures the Amaru, the Amaru, or Great Serpent predominate, the Amaru, Quetzalcoatl, the Amaru, or the Grand the Khans, the Serpent, the Snake Kings, right? Whose swift quivering movement was taken as an emblem of the streaks of lightning, so often seen there and said to come from the sun, a belief indirectly true. The Amaru Cancha, or Palace of Snakes, with its cornices and interior walls covered with gold, and the Temple of the Sun, where immense stone buildings enclosed in large aqueducts and gardens kept in order by priests, four thousands of whom were attached to the latter temple, where the royal family alone could enter, 
the surrounding ground being considered so holy that one could only walk with bare feet within 200 paces of it. Of the 300 temples at Cusco, this one unsurpassed in the greatness and richness of its decorations by any building in the world, all right? By any building in the world, all right? It's only one instance of the immense value of the treasures of Amaraca before the Spanish invasion. All right, this is what they were calling Amaraca, the Amaru people. All right, there's a connection here with Mexico, or the Mexicans, the Mayans, all right, Toltecs. Near this city is Olentay Tampo, with numerous palaces and buildings wrought in polished marble, where that of the Virgins of the Sun in marble of Amaracan art was well guarded by its position and bridges, not far from a rocky mountain which may still be seen for a mile long and 700 feet wide, apparently covered with white specks, which are tombs cut in the solid rock. The roads in this kingdom, says Baron de Humboldt, are the most useful and stupendous works ever executed by man, all right? Alexander de Humboldt is telling you that the Inca roads, all right? We're not talking about primitive people here. We're talking about high civilization, creators of civilizations, all right? The roads in this kingdom, says Baron de Humboldt, are the most useful and stupendous works ever executed by man. Their four chief route routes from Cusco rival the best Roman work, frequently going into the region of perpetual snow, completely closed in winter, through tunnels cut in solid rock, over giant precipices, by steps crossing rivers, by solid masonry, or suspension bridges swung with uh, osier ropes, leading along the tablelands of Pasco, the highest point of the Andes occupied by man, to their richest silver mines at an elevation of 14,000 feet above the level of the sea, and only 1,500 below the perpetual snow line. There are eight of these great highways in Chile, six in Bolivia, and three in Peru. The valleys of the great branches of the Andes are also especially adapted for these roads, which are connected with the sea coast by various passes over the western mountains, one of them running from the Pacific seaport of Trujillo, crosses over a summit of 11,600 feet before reaching Casa Amaraca, the capital of the kings, near which are the ruins of excavations through these mountains, made to afford an outlet to a lake which had during the rainy season inundated the surrounding country including the valley of Curimayo, 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 where gold was found in great quantities and smelted in furnaces. This road is continued to Popoyan and ended at Bogota. The capital of the kingdom of Kundin, Amaraca, is still a celebrated commercial thoroughfare. There are immense ruins at Casa Amaraca, with subterranean treasures vaults in the houses and a portion of the king's palace cut out of solid rock. Padre Calancha, one of the pioneers referring to the buried treasures of Casa Amaraca and other cities says that if they were discovered, they would be sufficient to enrich the world. All right, you see what's going on in the land of Prester John. You see when um, Marco Polo went to visit the Grand Khan, they're talking about these places in America right here, what they were encountering, you see, the kingdoms of Kundin Amaraca, the kingdoms of Amaraca, the Amaru, the Plum Serpent, the Snake Line, the Snake Kings, the Priest Kings. Continuing in the book, Discovery of the Origin of the Name of America. It says here, the population of the Empire of Amaraca which extended along the Pacific coast for 3,000 miles was estimated at 12 million, 12 million people. Kwayana Kapak, who was one of the most illustrious of the American kings, had subdued the entire country surrounding Quito and the queen of the newly conquered territory became one of his wives, by whom he had a son named Atahualpa, who was his favorite, although his brother Huascar was the lawful heir to the throne. During the monarch's last days, this queen induced him to issue a decree by which her son was to succeed him as the king of Quito, while his brother, the heir apparent, was to reign in the ancient kingdom at the 
king's death, Atahualpa proceeded to the capital of Quito, where he was royally received and assumed the crown. The late king had asserted that this decree was not contrary to the national law of primogeniture, as he was only returning Atahualpa to the nation of which he was the legitimate sovereign, Quito, being a new conquest. And uh, yeah, this story almost sounds like, you know, the story of uh, Jacob and Esau, Esau, right? And you see this image right here, it says that it's the king Atahualpa attacks his brother army near Casa Amaraca. See that? Historians disagree as to the cause of the war between the brothers in which Atahualpa defeated Huascar's army, annexed his kingdom, and imprisoned himself in the fortified city of An Amaraca, where he was held when the Spaniards arrived in Casa Amaraca. Continuing the book, Discovery of the Origin of the Name of America, it says here in the first standard map of the world showing the Western Hemisphere, it was called an island, and there also appeared another name, Tamaraqua, 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 meaning Amaraca or America, which was not an island, but part of the mainland, much resembling one, as may observed by our sketch. All right, so it says number three, but no, let's go to that. It says, the point of land, so like an isle, and now known as Maracaibo, was no doubt part of Amaraca Pana, or the country of Amaraca, mentioned by Humboldt. And it is curious illustration of these early errors to find it called by Ojeda, the Isle province and lake of Coquivacoa, which the crown appointed him governor of, though existing only in his imagination. But they soon found out their mistake, for the name Coqui meant Chipchi, the Chipchi royal race of the kingdom of Kundin, Amaraca. The Cape Chipchi was opposite the supposed Isle, Kodasi's map, and Mercator, getting nearer the fact, wrote it Kuchi and other Chipchi, which they found later on was the name of the people and not their country, and altered it to Maracaibo, which, like Maracapana, meant Amaraca or America, Amaraca, all right? Humble says that only two languages were spoken on the mainland first visiting, that of the Caribs, always at war with the people of Amaraca Pana, the Caribs, all right, were always warring with the Amaraca. We know that the Caribs were warring with the Arawakans, Arawakans, Anahuacans in Spanish, Anahuacans. We know the Mexicans called Anahuac, Amaracans. We know the Amaru, Amaraca, their connection there with Quetzalcoatl and the Mexicans, all right, so who must therefore have spoken the other, or Tamanagua. The Orenago, he adds, is Tamanagua word. Tamanagua, Tama, 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 Tamir, Tameri. It was probably from them that the Spaniards first heard of the treasures of Kundin Amaraca. It is evident that these people living on the coast of Amaraca were the Americans, for which the name Tamanagua, the Isle of Tamaraqua, are intended. We suppose that the Isle of Tamaragua might have meant Jamaica, pronounced Jamaica, ho ho ho, by the Spaniards, wow, Jamaica, by the Spaniards, Tamaragua, all right, was this Jamaica, is that what they're trying to say, Tamaragua was Jamaica, and would have explained the cause of Mercator's calling the West Indies, Camercan Islands, but the evidence we found disproved it, American, or Peruvian in parentheses, it says, was the diplomatic and fashionable language of the Western Hemisphere at the time of the Spanish conquest, as we now find French spoken all over the world because it has been accepted as the tongue which must be used by all nations in their official communications. When Christians became powerful enough to make their language international, they introduced their religion also, and so did the Americans who preached Amaru, or the cross, Amaru, or the cross, Amaru or the cross, to which we will refer presently, and consequently we find this faith all over America. On Mercator's map may be observed the name of the Arawakas, Arawakas, given to the country behind the Golden Castle Mountains on the coast of Amaraca Pana. The chief god of these people is Hua Amaracong, and they were neighbors of the Caribis in whose houses there was always a Maraca or Tamaraca, which was the name of their household god. And when shaken by their priests, the great spirit spoke through them. They were placed on the ground adorned with feathers and meat, and wine was placed before them, which the people 
thought they eat. Persia says that on the coast of Amaraka Pana, among their many idols and figures which they honor as gods, they have one like St. Andrew's cross, which they thought preserved them from night spirits, and they hanged it on their newborn children, a cross. These maracas or tamaracas were rattles. La maraca, the rattle, la maraca, right? No doubt of the amaru or rattlesnake. And so we find the sacred cross or amaru among all the Amaracan nations. The chief god at Haiti, where Columbus recited, was also Hua Amaracon. Again, the chief god of Haiti, Amaru, was an Amaru, was a plum serpent, a snake king, Hua Amaracon, written Amanacon, Amanacon by the Spaniards, Anacon, Amanacon. All right? You hear that? 